All right, what's up? Welcome in GC Live Wednesday episode. West Mitchell, Chris Clark, rolling right along into Jacksonville State Week. Got a great show planned for you here today as South Carolina coordinators Dow Loggins and Clayton White both hopped on their press conference to preview the Battle of the Gamecocks. First ever Battle of the Gamecocks. Before we get into that, though, going to tell you about our buddy Clint Hammond of Movement Mortgage, ClintHammond.com, 803-771-6933. Basically, if you're in the market to buy a home, Clint is your guy. I know interest rates aren't the greatest right now, but Clint is there to come up with a plan for you, just like he did for me and my wife. Uh, call him today or just go to his website. He's got all the information there, clinthammond.com. Yeah, I've, I've known Clint for actually about 10 years now, so I uh, wouldn't trust anybody more than I do Clint for um, that big process of, of buying a home. So uh, give Clint a shout. Chris? Coordinators today, and um, you know, for for once, let's start with the defense today. We normally start right. offense. We normally start sometimes special teams, and you know there was some good stuff from Dow Longs as well. Some of it I thought kind of confirmed some other things, or just put it into Dow's words as opposed to being necessarily new. But I thought it was kind of interesting. Clayton White today was asked. What offense do you compare this Jacksonville State scheme to? And this is something I don't think we've gotten to yet on the podcast. We, we've alluded to it a little bit on the radio show. But this is a spread-to-run offense. This is a tempo-to-run offense. Like, uh, this is not an air raid. They're, they're going to get to the line of scrimmage quickly, but then they're going to snap the football and try to get you in and out of your – your run fits, like out of your run gaps, and they're going to try to break those off into long runs. And if you're sitting there saying, man, that sounds quite a bit like what Tennessee does, that was the exact first thing that popped to mind for Clayton White when he was asked, of the schools you've played, of the schemes you've played against this year, who does it remind you of? And uh, he instantly said Tennessee. Yeah, and with that comes a challenge, right? Because – Anytime you're playing a team that can, I would say, number one, Russ, run the run the football with that pace, that makes it difficult. So when you think about teams that go fast, that can be challenging because it's tough to run a play, get your heels in the dirt, get the call, and get ready to play the next play. That can be tough. It can get defenses off balance. But honestly, I think when teams can run the football out of a tempo like that, it makes it even more challenging, right? Now, there's a third layer. Now, let me back up. Let's not compare Jacksonville State to Tennessee in terms of, like, overall talent production. Obviously, Jacksonville State, first year transitioning to the Sun Belt, having quite a good year, 7-2 and two under Rich Rodriguez. So I don't want to undersell them. Also don't want people saying, hey, Chris Clark said that Jacksonville State's as good as Tennessee. Not saying that either. But in terms of the challenges, you have the tempo. You have the ability to run the ball out of that tempo. And there's a third element to this, Wes, and that is that their quarterback can run the football, right? And that makes it tough, too. So Zion Webb, their starter, missed some time this year. He's he's healthy, seems good to go. He's a guy that can really run the football. Um, he has, looking it up here, Right now, what he's rushed for at 460 yards. So even missing time, Wes, he's your second leading rusher. You got to wonder, if he hadn't missed some time, would he be their leading rusher? Has 460 yards on the year, has a 61-yard long, has four touchdowns. He's averaging 5.6 a pop. And we know with the way that Rich Rodriguez administers this run game, the zone read, it can be tough to get your eyes kind of out of sorts, right? It can be easy to become undisciplined, especially when you're playing the tempo and when you've got threats all over the field. That makes it tough. So certainly a big challenge. And and I that was the first thing that stuck out to me when listening to Clayton White too is is him drawing that comparison to Tennessee because um, if you got a team that has good players and they're running a difficult to defend system, it, it can end up being a long day if you don't play well. Yeah, and I, I think you look at Rich Rod, 
most of his offenses, and I, I can't sit here and say I followed him closely enough. You know, maybe at Arizona or even not, you know there maybe there may maybe a year at Michigan where I don't know if he had his quarterback to to run his scheme, but when he has his quarterback, it's always been, hey, this is going to be zone read and that quarterback run option is a huge part of it. This is not a quarterback who has racked up those yards just on, you know, scrambles or non-designed runs. You're talking about scheming it up where your quarterback has a choice and he's keeping the football. And not only has he hit that number that you said earlier, you know, while missing time, college football, you subtract you subtract the sacks from – the running total for a quarterback. So you're talking about, I, I don't know how many times he's been hit or how many times he's been sacked, but you're talking about um, him hitting a pretty big number while having that affecting his numbers. So I, I think for them and for his schemes throughout the years, I mean, you can go back, shoot, man, I think it's like the early 90s when the zone read became a thing. And it used to be that – you know, you want to talk about having some guys that have are kind of coaching legends. I don't know if you think of Rich Rod as being a coaching legend, but when you think of his impact on the game, he absolutely should be a guy. It's kind of like if we, we talked about Mike Leach and how cool that would have been to see the great late Mike Leach be on the sidelines of – Williams Bryce Stadium, if they would have played him this year. You know, I don't think you put Rich Rodriguez quite there, but as far as the impact on everybody else's schemes, who doesn't run some element of zone read? It is in every single offense these days. And he's largely credited with inventing the thing. And there was a time when the shotgun was really considered a throwing formation and you got in the shotgun in passing situations just to give your quarterback a little extra time because people did not think you could consistently run the football out of the shotgun. And now just about everybody has the shotgun as their base offense. And it's because of the zone read. Yeah. And it was fascinating Wes, because, you know, I was actually reading up a little bit, kind of going back and trying to recall some of the history of Rich Rodriguez's career. He's had a fascinating career, obviously, and he kind of pioneered. Others were doing some of the, obviously, the spread, the tempo attack, but he added in the zone read apparently because he saw one of his quarterbacks in practice notice a, a defender on the end crashing down on his running back and noted that the the quarterback pulled the ball and ran it himself. And Rich Rod asked him why he did that. And he said, well, I read the defender and it was a dead place. So I kept it and see, well, let's kind of create a concept to build around this. So Gamecock fans will remember Woody Danzler at Clemson under Rich Rod running this offense. You'll remember, I mean, the fun one for me, Wes, was, you know, uh, Pat White at West Virginia. I mean, that was a lot of fun. It's easy to forget because of what Nick Saban has done at Alabama, that Rich Rodriguez was incredibly close to being the head coach of the University of Alabama. That would have been fascinating and kind of changed history as well. He obviously had the Michigan stops, the Arizona stops. He's been at Ole Miss, you know, as an OC. So a lot of interesting uh, stops for him, but it's no doubt that he's a pioneer of this type of offense that we see so much nowadays and, and even more concepts built off of that zone read to you know, a zone read with a throw, a bubble, right? The RPO game. A lot of this stuff that we've seen crop up in college football, he he should probably get a lot of credit for. And just generally, it's a tough system, you know, to go back to how we opened the show, a very, very tough system, you know, to, to defend when you got players that can run it well. Well, and I, you, to your point, I, you do not probably have RPOs if you don't originally have the zone read. I mean, the, the zone read was basically, all right, that's one less guy we have to block because we're going to read them instead. And now all the little offshoots of that are, well, hey, 
rather than leaving the backside um, defender, backside end, unblocked, what if we go, I guess a lot of people call it like inverted veer. This is something Cam Newton and Auburn and Gus Malzahn ran over all the SEC with where you say you're going to leave the front side end unblocked. And that was sort of that little look where the running back is more at like an outside zone angle. And then you would see Cam Newton kind of uh, ride that mesh point and then go up the middle. Then you say, you see, they say, well, what if we don't block the three technique? And yeah, you know, that's leaving an inside tackle unblocked and reading him. Well, then the expansion of that was, what if we don't block a linebacker or even a safety and throw over top of this run? And so all those little things that built off of that kind of go back to that zone read concept. And so I, I think that's kind of fun. As I've, gotten old, as I've gotten older, I try to appreciate the history of things a little bit more. And, you know, I, I think that's pretty cool to think about. Also, um, Jay Diz bringing up this point, according to Rich Rod, he turned us down. Um, you know, by, by all indications, no, Rich Rod did not have an offer from South Carolina. But, I mean, Chris, you and I have a very funny story involving that that's maybe for another podcast. I don't know. Um, but th there clearly were some discussions there when South Carolina had its um, opening before Shane Beamer. Yeah, that was that was quite a saga, Wes, and and we may, we may have to re we, we need to find a way to tell that story to retell that story because I think we told it um, probably a few years ago. That was in man December twenty fifteen. You know, is when that happened when that long process that led to the the Will Muschamp hire at South Carolina. Um, yeah, that that was fascinating, but it it was interesting because I remember that night that this is just a small, small part of the story. There was that night where it was reported, you know, that Rich Rod turned the job down, that he was staying at the University of Arizona, um, you know, and, and spurning the Gamecocks offer. And of course, the folks we talked to said that that was not true. He was not actually offered. He had been obviously in the mix for the job. Depends on who you ask in terms of, what you may hear as to how heavily he was in the mix. Um, but said he turned the job down. You could tell that Rich Rod and his people were kind of leaking that out there. And I, I do remember he was asked about it later, and Rich Rod kind of walked it back. Like he said, there, there wasn't enough on either side to make the move, which made you think, okay, you know. But, uh, yeah, we need to retell that story sometime because that was quite interesting. But he, he was in the mix. He was in the mix here. I remember too. His name comes up. Fans are like, "No, not interested." <laughs> like we, we do, we do not like this idea at all. Um, I mean, the guy, the guy has a resume now. Like he, um, I, I think, yeah, Jay did say. I think he got fired a year later. I'm trying to look at his Arizona tenure. Um. He had, he had some moment. He got fired. Let's see after twenty seventeen season because they they had it rolling for a second. Let me see twenty fourteen. They were five and zero to start the year, top ten ranking, beat number two Oregon. Um, I mean I don't know if Rich Rod's the best choice for South Carolina at that time either, but it's not like the dude was just a scrub. <laughs> you know, like he, this guy knows football. It, it was interesting how universally denied that idea was by the fan base. Yeah, it seemed pretty unpopular. I, I do recall some that were like, hey, he'll come in there and run the offense. We could do a lot worse. I mean, I do recall some, but it was, it was generally, and I mean, people look back on some of the off field stuff. They looked at the, the tenure at Michigan, right, and and how that ended, uh, but yeah, that that whole saga, man, that that coaching search, West, that could be, what do you think, a book one day, probably on that whole deal. Yes, and to be clear, I'm I'm reading here now, um, guys. Maybe I mean, maybe I just 
missed all this or deleted it from my brain. The Arizona firing was also involved allegations beyond football. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Some more off-field stuff. Yes, yeah, so I d- I don't want to. I don't want to inadvertently gloss over that out of my own ignorance on what exactly happened. Um, of course, some of those allegations were denied. Um, but so obviously we, we don't have the details on all that, but just worth pointing out. Um, it was more off the field allegations that were involved in that. So we're just more speaking to him with what we know, what we've witnessed him on the football field to be completely clear, which let's get back into the game here. Um, for South Carolina this week, it is definitely an issue of, hey, don't don't let this scheme, don't let the speed be what gets you. You know, I, I think the thing when you're facing a Tennessee, Chris, is that, I mean, I, I knew Tennessee was pretty good watching them play South Carolina, but going back, watching – watching them play Kentucky this past week and some of the things they did up front on both sides of the ball in that game, watching their running backs run against a pretty good Kentucky defense. And you kind of, you stack the scheme on top of some real talented playmakers and Jacksonville state. They, they got some guys. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm, I'm not throwing shade on their players, but compared to, that three-headed monster at Tennessee and their running backs that compared to the size of Tennessee's offensive line and even Joe Milton starting to get a little bit more going in the running game as he's gotten healthy. It, it's just a that's a different that's a different ball game. If you're South Carolina, you should be able to handle these guys physically. So you just don't want to get yourself in a position where the scheme and the pace are what gets you. And that that's where playing Tennessee, you know, every year should be something you can lean on to prepare for this game, I think. Yeah, you've got, you know, under this coaching staff in this scheme, you've got three years of that, right? And, you know, the Gamecocks, I would say, year one against Tennessee did not handle it well at all. They handled it better year two. I, I think so. – you know, Tennessee had a, a historic offense in many ways in 2022. And I think the fact that South Carolina put up 63 and got some stops and things like that in that game kind of masked the fact that, you know, Tennessee still put up some points and put up some yards and had some huge, huge chunk offensive plays in that game. And a lot of those are created by the system. And then, like you said, Wes, you couple great players on that. Did the Gamecocks handle it great this year? No, but you didn't see – I think you've seen because they've played Tennessee and it's not the first time, do they have troubles with it sometimes? Sure, because everybody does. It, it presents those challenges. But it wasn't like year one to me uh, because a lot of these guys have kind of been through it. So that that's what you don't want to see, to your point, Wes. You don't want to see guys not getting lined up, guys not getting the signal, right? An offense like this – is going to get you out of sorts at times. But you don't want to be watching the game on Saturday and see several instances of guys, you know, not having their hands in the dirt, not having their heels in the dirt if you're the linebackers, looking to the sideline when the ball is being snapped. You want to be in place and ready to go and then deal with the challenges as they're presented to you. Getting, you know, not having your eyes in the right place before the snap, not being ready before the snap, those are the things that can really, really hurt you against a team like this. Yeah, and I think the fact they combine it with, uh, much like Tennessee, you're playing in space as well. That means you're in a situation where, hey, if one guy is out of his spot or one guy misses a tackle, um, you know, you're going to have some explosive runs. I, I think, you know, we were playing Beamer press conference bingo about what he was going to mention in the presser, and I, um, I'm mad at myself, dude. Did not catch on to the stat. We were on it on some of them. I did not catch on prior to it about them being one of the best in the country at number of explosive runs. And, you know, I I think if you're South Carolina and, you know, we didn't 
bring up the Florida State thing, the fact they beat Florida State a couple years ago. And a little bit different Florida State team. They've gone uh, portal. They've gone heavy into the portal since then. But still, um, the, the point was made, hey, these guys can come in and beat you if you're not ready. And so I, I think they do all these things, much like Tennessee. It's not the, it's not the two-yard run here, the three-yard run here. It's that they're just going to keep rolling at you. And they know, or in their minds, they believe oh, we're going to start breaking off a few of these. And then when they break them off, that's when I feel like you can really feel a defense get on its heels because you're you're sprinting down the field. The, the sort of context of where the down markers are has changed. So now, all right, we're 14 yards downfield. All right, where's the sign? Like, where's the guy signaling in? Your angle has changed. And that's when I think they really speed you up because as a defense, you're almost getting your bearings, and then, oh, wait, they're snapping the ball? Like, they snap the ball as fast as anybody in the country, not named Tennessee. So I, I think for, for this defense, it, or for any defense playing them, it can snowball on you a little bit. So you just, even if you have an early lead on them, if you're South Carolina, you kind of just can't relax against offenses like this. Yeah, because it can be, you know, Two-yard run, four-yard run, three-yard run, five-yard run, two-yard run, one-yard run. We're okay, we're okay, 25-yard run, right? And then – so you just have to be disciplined. And, and you can say, well, Chris, you, you know, that can happen against any team running the football. But, you know, it's just different playing a team like this because of how they administer the offense, right? You can, you can feel really good about stymieing the run and that you're playing it really well. And then you get out of sorts on one play. You've got a mobile quarterback, and they can really, really, you know, make you pay for it. So a unique challenge, no doubt, for South Carolina. We knew, Wes, that Beamer, like you said, was going to let everybody know, his team, the media, the fans via the media, that, hey, this is a team that beat Florida State a couple years ago, that, you know, that has a coach who's, seen football at the highest levels, has a, a proven system, a pioneer of a, of a particular type of system with the zone read that has good players, that's playing really well this year, um, and that, you know, can really hit you in some of the areas that this team, South Carolina, has has struggled with. Let's hit uh, our friend Trey Harrell. Trey helps. Let's tell you about him. Trey Harrell is a personal injury attorney. Right here in the great state of South Carolina, he helps folks that are injured in auto accidents all over Gamecock country. You see there, if you're watching the video stream, the graphic, at Trey Helps. What does that mean? Well, that means he can help you, and it means you can find him on social media. Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok is where you can find Trey Harrell. You can also find him online at attorneyharrell.com. Now, if you follow him on social, he's got some neat tips for you, does some cool stuff on social. If you know someone who's been injured in an auto accident in the Palmetto State, we obviously hope you don't, hope you never become injured in an auto accident. But if you are, it can be a tough place, and so don't go at it alone. Find you an attorney who's going to fight for you, who knows the law, who's going to fight to get you what de- what you deserve. Find an attorney who helps. Remember that Trey helps. Again, that's at Trey Helps. Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok, or visit his website, attorneyharrell.com. No doubt. Appreciate Trey uh, not only being a supporter of GC Live, but a big-time supporter of Gamecocks football. So, as we always tell you about our sponsors, if you want to support people who support us and support South Carolina, support these guys as well. Um, All right, hey, let's move to offense, man. Or, uh, real quick, actually, I I don't want to go too deep into it because we've we've already hit on it some this week. But, um, you know, we joke that Dow Loggins – listens to GC Live or watches GC Live. I don't think he actually does, but Clayton White, I think, was listening this week as well because he said the exact things we were saying about Bam Martin Scott and Jaron Willis in terms of what they have brought to that kind of 3-3-5 look that South Carolina used a a little bit on Saturday. You kind of get the feeling, Chris, that 
that thing's here to stay and, and probably going to sort of grow over these final four weeks because I think it gives South Carolina a just a little bit of a different look for teams to have to deal with. And I think the goal now, the thing you have to do now if you're South Carolina is take what you did on Saturday and now build off of it, build some complimentary looks off of it because I got a feeling A&M, they probably go out there. Their offensive protection is like, wait a second. We haven't seen this on film from them all year. And it, it kind of gave them some trouble early on. And so now teams, they'll go into practice this week. They'll say, hey, guys, you're going to get this sort of 3-3-5 stack on fourth down. This is the personnel. This is their um, tendencies. And so now I think you have to build off of that moving forward. But it did feel like they're pretty happy with the results of that new look um, based on a handful of snaps. Yeah, and and Jaron Willis and Bam Martin Scott, and I think Clayton White also pointed this out today. They're they're kind of similar in, you know, their their body type and their skill set. In that, you know, Willis is someone who has some pass rush juice. You know, you think about him as a high school player, played some DB. He played a lot of rush end. So while he was viewed as a college linebacker, he's somebody that his high school team, Lee County, really good high school program they lined him up on the edge a lot and said, go get the quarterback. And you can see with his body type, his athleticism, he kind of has a knack for that. And it's similar with Bam Martin Scott. He's flashed during his career, Bam has, you know, that that ability to go rush the passer and, and give them something extra blitzing with the, with the extra man in the backfield. So I thought it was a nice wrinkle for South Carolina. Clayton White pointed out that the guys seemed to like playing that because it, it was something different did give the offense, the opposing offense, a different look. And so I would guess, Wes, that uh, if they get into some situations where they can utilize it, we'll, we'll probably see it some more. Yeah, I, um, I I really think for this week, and I, God, guys, I really struggle not to just go back to the stop the run and put them in third and long, cliche. Um, but But bear with me here. You look at their ability to throw the football, they being Jacksonville State, not a high percentage passer, just statistically. And a lot of these offenses that are so run-based, um, they're hitting their big pass plays on first downs, on second and shorts, on situations where they are staying ahead of the chains and kind of uh, keeping you on your heels. You have to worry about the run so much that they're going to use that to mix in some big throws and the windows just aren't as tight for your quarterback in those situations. If you put them, if you're South Carolina and you put them in, in third downs, then in third and longs, what is what I'm really saying? You're going to, you're going to see this defense magically get those turnovers that we've talked about being missing for the last month. So you're, you're going to know in the first quarter on Saturday. If you keep looking up and Jacksonville State is in third and two for the entire first quarter, then you're, you're going to be sitting there sweating it for a little while if that doesn't get cleaned up. If South Carolina, if you're hearing the rooster crow and you're looking up and South Carolina's in third and nine and they're having to drop back and throw into the teeth of this defense, I know South Carolina's had – you know, they've had their issues with stopping the pass this year, but then you're going to see South Carolina be able to heat them up, force some throws, and there will be two or three forced turnovers in this game because that typically is what happens when you've got a little bit of an overmatched football team, I feel like, in this case, Jacksonville State, going into an environment like South Carolina and having to do something they're not completely comfortable with. So – I think that's kind of the the early game within the game is that, um, you know, J.D. is saying I'm having running quarterback PTSD. You know, I, I think the real, the real sort of killer for defenses is a running quarterback that also can hurt you with his arm. And, you know, this kid obviously can do that when they're in – um, advantageous downs and distances. But my question is, can he drop back on third and long 
and hurt South Carolina's defense. I like your chances if you're South Carolina, if he's in those situations. He's going to run out of there a couple times and get you, and it's going to be frustrating. You're going to slam your hat down on the bleacher or whatever. You're going to be ticked off. But you can live with that, honestly, because the zone read stuff, you're going to be prepared for the designed runs from this kid because that's what you're going to be working on all week long. Yeah, first down defense is huge. And, you know, you say, well, Chris, you could say that any game, right? But Gamecocks have struggled on third downs getting off the field this year, Wes. And a lot of that is because, I mean, we talked about this ad nauseum after Florida, right? And not <laughs> not third down in that game. Actually, fourth down was kind of South Carolina's undoing. But been a lot of third and longer situations where they've just given up too many yards let teams convert fourth downs. We saw it against A&M with some fourth and shorts that they were able to convert. You had the early third and 17 where Evan Stewart makes a great play at A&M. Now instead of getting off the field or even just holding them to a 10-yard a gain, right? He gets 16, and now you're in fourth and short. You know, it, it'd be one thing to say, well, first down hasn't mattered as much for South Carolina because they they forced some third and longs at times and still haven't been able to get off the field. It is different on this one, in this game, because if you get Jacksonville State in third and eight, third and nine, third and ten, third and longer than that, and that's where they're living, like you said, you do like your chances more in this one, Wes, as opposed to, you know, if they're in third and three all game, that's going to be a rough day because they're probably going to keep moving the ball. When they get down to the red area, they're going to be proficient at running the football down there. Uh, they're going to be just as good down there doing that, even with constrained spaces when things kind of tighten up. Um, so you don't want to be just relying on turnovers. You don't want to have Jacksonville State going up and down the field and saying, gosh, hopefully somebody fumbles the football, right? That's not what you want to be in. You want to be in a position where you can force those turnovers by putting them in unfavorable situations. Yeah, and I think this is a game, man, where your your guys up front, like the the one way that you can just completely neutralize a, a good scheme, just win your one on one battles up front. And I, I know that's that's easier said than done a lot of weeks, but I, I think for South Carolina, uh, you know, TJ Sanders, Boogie Huntley, Tonka Hemingway, those guys in the middle of your defense, this is the week you want them to just win those battles and um you know, kind of take over a little bit because that's how you that's how you get them off schedule is to have those tackles for loss and and, and kind of put them at a disadvantage that way. Okay, on to offense. Like I said, I guess ten minutes ago, um, but we're actually going to move on to offense at this point. And I thought worth mentioning a lot of this was kind of rehashing of some stuff we've already talked about. I thought, but let's double down on an idea. Something Dow Loggins made very, very, uh, very specifically said, and it sounded almost like he was answering to some fans or answering some questions, and that was, he specifically said, hey, some people may say, and we've seen this take on social media, some people may say, why was this guy not in the game week one? And he was talking about Mario Anderson, he was talking about Nicholas Harbor, and he was like, you guys may not, be here at practice to see the progress and his point was do not assume because a guy is playing more now and making some plays that this was the same player in week one or week four now you know we're on to week 10 I guess game nine and um these guys need to be commended for making that progress as the season has gone along as opposed to automatically going to the default of, well, why wasn't he playing week one? Yeah, it, it really should. And I feel like, you know, Dowell kind of went into this in a different press conference. Um, and I can't remember what specifically he was answering. Then he's probably talking about Nick Carver, right? And just, I know you've harped on this all year, Wes, like players are not the same. And I think we assume when a guy plays well, that is always what he has been. <laughs> and, that, and, you know, when we talk about development, when fans talk about development, well, you can't say the coaches need to develop guys 
but then just assume that never took place in the past, right? You know, when we look at guys who are seniors and they're playing really well, and maybe they're playing really, really well for the first time in their career, like they're getting the most snaps, they're starting, they're getting some NFL buzz. It could be that you look back in their trajectory, and when they were freshmen, they didn't do much. They didn't play. They struggled. That happens. And so, now, are coaches infallible? Absolutely not. There can there can always be instances where there might be some legitimate parts to saying, shouldn't that guy have gotten a chance earlier? But the thing to remember is, generally, coaches are trying to play the guys they feel give them the best chance to win. And they do have the most data on that. They chart practice. They see mental mistakes. They see physical mistakes. They see how guys are progressing. And even for Mario Anderson, who had an incredible career at Newberry, I would say, Wes, there is a reason that we went through a large part of the offseason saying, hey, I, I think Mario Anderson will have something to say here. But we it's not like we were hearing this guy's far and away the best back on. It wasn't like when Marcus Lattimore came in. He's a freshman, and you immediately start hearing he's the best back on the team. You, you didn't really hear that. And that was even knowing that he put up huge numbers at Newberry. You knew there'd be an adjustment, right? And so he's continued to come along and get better and better. He's gotten better. Remember something early? Pass protection, Wes. He's gotten better there. He's gotten more and more comfortable. And then as he's gotten more comfortable, he's been able to rely on those physical traits that made him so successful at the smaller level and that have now been able to translate. Same thing with Nick Carver. I mean, the Nick Carver that we just saw against a and that wasn't Nick Carver from week one. That's because there's a progression and there is a development. So I think you make a great point. That's a great way to put it in that celebrate a guy's development and progression instead of saying, well, he did this in week eight. That means he could have done it in week one, especially for young players. That's not true. Travis saying uh... – a good point here is coach speak, but coaches are going to play the players they trust. And if, you know, and another way of saying that is it, it is easy, even, you know, Dow was talking about even Eli Drinkowitz sees Nick Harbor and is like, man, that's a good looking kid right there. And everybody that sees Nick Harbor for the first time in person is like, all right, he looks like he could be in the NFL right now. Like, that, that's a thing. Physically, he absolutely does look like he could be in the NFL right now. But I think when, when you and I and fans and everybody sees a guy who looks great athletically, but then, you know, we see him make some plays and we go, why haven't they been playing before? Well, we're not seeing the hidden plays where, um, you know, let's say a guy runs a wrong route. A guy running the wrong route can be the difference in – an incomplete pass or a completion versus interception going the other way. And, you know, you want to look at a running back. The uh, the running back and his ability in pass pro can be the difference in your quarterback getting hit and um, your quarterback not getting hit. So, um, and Troy says you don't know what a player can do until you put him on the field. I disagree with that take a trillion percent. Um, like I, I used to, when I, I used to kind of, you know, some guys are gamers. Some guys make plays in games. Yes, that is true. Some guys step up to the moment when they really need to. And some guys play down to the moment. That is true. But running the right route, being where you're supposed to be, uh, using great technique in pass pro, using great technique in other things. Those are the things you show in practice. That has absolutely zero to do with are you a gamer or not. That has zero to do with can you make plays in a game. That is something like I, I think we lose sight of that when we say, oh, well, you got to play a guy in a game to show what he can do. No, a guy can show that he can run the right route, that he can be in the right spot every single day in practice. Yeah, totally. There, there are things that. You know, something Loggins, I think, says is you 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 play how you practice, right? And so 
Wes, I'll be honest. So, so an example, an example using Nick Carver of both of these things that we just talked about. So, like that catch he made against Florida, I was honestly a little surprised by it, right? Like because you knew that consistency with hands is something that he's been working on to his credit very hard and, and a place where he's come a long way. That was a manifestation of that. Spencer Rattler had confidence that I'm throwing the ball. Nick Carver went out and got it. Staff trusted Nick Carver to be out there in that situation. And so I think he rose to the occasion on that, right? But why did that happen? Well, it's because he has progressed and has put in that work. Earlier in the season, would they have trusted, would Spencer Rattler trusted to throw that ball? Would the coaching staff have trusted him in that situation? Maybe not, because in game one as a freshman, given all the circumstances, you just don't know. And so, yeah, running the wrong route, interception, sack, getting your quarterback hurt, getting your quarterback injured, a lot of negatives. And if a guy hypothetically, hypothetical situation, is running the wrong route consistently in practice, the place to work on that and to workshop that is not in let you know what let's put him out there against a and m and i bet we'll we'll kind of figure it out on the fly that's probably not the best you know place to do that so there are things you have to work out and practice and improve upon and then when you get in the game situation and you're comfortable then you might can you know you're going to have the opportunity to to rise to the occasion and, and do it in that situation yeah and um uh, i see some of the comments specifically on uh mario anderson and uh saying Hey, he looked like he maybe was the better back at the very beginning. The, just watching him run the football, I I think I think that maybe ignores two things. One of those being the away from the football part of playing running back, and the fact that you better have that part down as well. And Mario Anderson himself has told us, "Look, Coach Hardesty sort of broke me down and built me back up." And I had a long way to go in pass pro. It also ignores the fact that, so game one is a game one. You're going, you're always rolling out your guys you trust the most in game one, especially away from home against a power five opponent. By game two, guys, that's Furman. They emptied the bench in that game. Everybody got to play. And frankly, I don't think you could tell anything about the running backs in game one because there was just literally no room to run. So game three, I don't think I'm skipping one. Georgia's game three, right? Mm -hmm. Game three, you already started to see more Mario Anderson in that game, right? Yep. They didn't run the football very much in that game at all. So that that's a different argument you can make. but. Mario was already starting to play more by game three. And then game four, they didn't start him, but he was the lead back. So it's really not like they just took forever to insert Mario Anderson into the conversation at running back. Like it was it was actually a fairly quick shift there. And also you need two backs. So yeah. just because Mario Anderson has become kind of the lead back of this group at the same time, you know you're going to need to carry on Joiner, um, you know, to, to be a guy as well. So I, I think there's a little bit, not from y'all in the chat, I'm just talking in general, um, not talking about y'all specifically at all. I'm just talking in general. There's a little bit of revisionist history about like, how things have played out with some of these guys. You see people say, well, you know, why didn't Nick Harbour play? To Nick Harbour was on the field at the yeah. beginning of the season as well. Nick Harbour is one of only four guys that are scholarship true freshmen that have played in all eight games. So now was he playing as many snaps then? Of course not. But um, it's always a process. Yeah, and he's also making more of the snaps he's getting, right? So if you think about – why could he possibly be playing more? I, you know, you can take the the two different sides of it would be, A, so, taking the extreme of, well, the coaches are all dummies for not playing him. You know, he he was 
he was exactly this player week one, week two, week three, as he was last week against A&M, right? They're dumb for not playing him. Or you could go to what I think is more realistic of Nick Harbour has been working hard and he's improved, right? He's improved his hands. He's improved his route running. He's become more comfortable. He's become more confident. Which of those seems more likely, just from a common sense standpoint? And then you can actually go to the info of, you know, a lot of the things that we've heard, and that is Nick Harbour's improved. And so, yes, he's played more because he's trusted to play more, but he's also made some plays out there, which then reinforces that trust that the staff has. West Mississippi State was game four, right, for Mario Anderson, I think. Game four, 26 carries. That's actually his high this whole season. Carried the ball 26 times in game four. So it's not like he just – that 75-yard run against Tennessee was the first time he carried the football, right? He, he's he been carrying the football since pretty early in the year, and I think you did a good job of laying out, you know, the different circumstances there for, uh, as to why that's happened. All right, guys, before we move on, I'm going to tell you about our friends at game time, of course. We have all been in a situation where you're trying to get that tough ticket, maybe concert, maybe a sporting event, uh, whatever it may be, is sold out. And um, I'm going to tell you about the fastest growing ticket app out there. So they tell me, Game Time. Go to GameTime.co or just download the Game Time app on the App Store, whether that's Apple or Android. And the great thing about this is it's all guaranteed. They are obsessed with saving you money. So if you go on there, and if you buy a ticket and you elsewhere are able to find a ticket in the same section and it's cheaper, they're going to refund you 110% of the dis- uh, the difference. That is the game time guarantee. Here's the game time app right here, as you can hopefully see. There's the Jacksonville State versus USC game. They got this thing right here called flash deals that you can slide to unlock. Um, I guess that means the deal is so good that they can't even show it to you off the bat. And um, Boom, just off the bat, you're getting it 9% off with that flash deal. And uh, those uh, those numbers will vary, but from time to time, a flash deal will pop up. You'll have 15 minutes to take advantage of it. Uh, go to GameTime.co or, like I said, GameTime app. Use the promo code GAMECOCKS. And so to do that, all you do is hit your profile on there at the bottom right. Hit redeem code. It's going to pop up just like this. And then uh, type in GAMECOCKS. And uh, instantly, you're going to get $20 off your first purchase on there. Again, that's the Game Time app at GameTime.co. Uh, Chris, what, was it a less than – I feel like there wasn't much meat on the bone today from the press conferences compared no. to maybe the last couple of weeks. Maybe a little less uh, – I don't know. Not There hasn't been drama, but they're just – I feel like A and M sort of went the way fans sort of had resigned themselves to think that Carolina might might lose. There's just a little less controversy, I think, going into this week, um, in terms of what was asked. Let's see. Loggins did talk about the intentional groundings, and mm-hmm. in, in great detail. By the way, of I course. won't even try to go through right now all the details of it, but go to our YouTube. We'll have the video up. He goes through every single grounding, but it, it kind of ultimately the summary, the spark notes version of it is that Chris basically Rattler had been told, do not take sacks, do not take sacks, do not take sacks, get the ball out, get the ball out, get the ball out. Ideally, if you get the ball out, you wanted it to be either a little bit like a yard and a half outside or near a receiver. But some of that was just that it was such a focus, I think, to get the ball out that um, these decisions are happening in microseconds. Yes. And, you know, he he used, Wes, your symptom uh, terminology in there. As well, which uh, bonus points to Dow Loggins, another another GC Live bit of evidence. Just kidding. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think it kind of his explanation to me without getting super, like, 
dialed in and granular on it is kind of what we suspected after the game of you go in there against a team that's leading the country in tackles for loss and leading the country in sacks. You know that against this defense that's been really good on third down, you can't go down in there and get and have third and 17. And, and so what ends up happening is you're hyper-focused on that. I'm not going to take a sack. I'm not going to take a sack. And you end up getting rid of the ball, and you you end up in that instance making a few plays where, you know, maybe one of them you could have spun out of there, right? You've also, t- to, to Rattler's credit, you've tried that a couple times this season and end up getting caught, right, um, for four sacks. And so for him – you're going to get rid of the football. You've had it kind of drilled into your game prep. Unfortunately, there were just a few situations where the ball wasn't quite in the right place or you weren't in the right place given where you threw the football. For sure, man. Um, by the way, did you know this could be the trivia question for the week? If I can find it. I had it right here. Did you know that Jacksonville State has a player whose brother played at South Carolina. I didn't. Who who would that be? So um, some of you may remember. Most of you probably will. Freddie Brown the third that played oh, at South yeah. Carolina. Oh yeah, from Spartanburg, and. Uh, Jacksonville State offensive lineman Traylon Brown. Okay. It's from Spartanburg as well. And so AL.com quoted Traylon this week talking about the game. And uh, he said he always envisioned himself being a Gamecock. Um, he just wound up a Jacksonville State Gamecock instead. So <laughs> there you go. It's funny, all the, no matter who you play. In college football, there's all these little webs that tie teams together. Yes, and Fred and Freddie Brown West actually spent um, some time as a college coach. Actually, not sure what he's doing now, but I do remember he was the wide receivers coach at Wofford um, for at least a time. Not sure what he's doing now. Any upstate South Carolina people, tell us what Freddie's doing now because I'm not sure. Yep, Freddie Brown the third uh, brother playing for Jacksonville State. Pretty cool. Um, all right. I think that's it, man. You got anything else on the game? No, nah, man. I'm good today. We'll have final preview, of course, on Friday. We'll have some type of guest, or we will roll an interview from, from Tyler Head with a guest as well. And uh, so we'll give you a little bit of the, the from the other sideline view on Jacksonville State. And also, uh, guess what? Tax time is right around the corner. Believe it or not, in a couple of months, you'll be looking for somebody to do your taxes. And we just want to tell you to give our friends at Liberty Tax here in Columbia a chance to earn your business. 803-462-5576. I can tell you about the great customer service. I can tell you about how they do Chris's taxes and have done a fantastic job. They're going to do my taxes this year. But also, guys, if you want to support a Gamecock and a great Gamecock, and uh, someone that um, supports the Gamecocks, then support Larry and his team. They've got three convenient locations throughout the Columbia area, 803-462-5576. All right, y'all, I believe that's it for Chris. I'm Wes. Mike will see you tomorrow, and uh, we will see you on Friday. See y'all then.